Hi, I'm Femi OK. Campaigning continues in Brazil. Are you there, there, Brazilians? No, not yet. You have a runoff election at the end of the month between the former president, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, and the current president, Jair Bolsonaro. What will be the impact for Brazil and the rest of the world? That is what we're talking about. And you can weigh in because at this point, viewers, you're about, being going to be about as accurate as the Brazilian pollsters. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about today's discussion. Lucia, Cecilia, Gilliam, it's so good to see all of you on today's show. Lucia, please say hello to our audience around the world. Hi there, everyone. I'm Lucia Newman, senior Latin American correspondent for Al Jazeera. Good to have you. Welcome back, Cecilia. Please say hello to our audience. Hi, Femi. So good. So nice to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Cecilia Tornaghi. I'm managing editor at America's Quarterly. Good to have you. And Gilliam, welcome to the stream. Please say hello to our viewers around the world. Hello, it's great to be here. I'm Guilherme Casarões, a political scientist and a professor at the Getúlio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo. All right, guys, I am going to ask you about the mood in Brazil right now, but I'm going to go via some voters on the day after round one of the elections was announced. This is what they had to say. Let's have a listen. I can no longer believe in opinion polls. I think Bolsonaro will still do a lot to surprise us. I'll only believe results once the judge blows the whistle at the end of the game. I was surprised. I thought Lula should have won in the first round. My expectation was that there might be a second round, but that at least Bolsonaro would lead and Lula would be below him. But it was the opposite, so I was disappointed. <laughs> oh, so the uh, opinions, passions are all over the place. Um, Lucia. Uh, what are you feeling? What are you seeing right now from, from people who actually took time to vote on October the 2nd? Well, I absolutely agree. I don't think I found a single person who was happy with the result, who was satisfied, or who wasn't, in some cases, even shocked. Not so much because um, Lula da Silva, the, the former president, w did very well. He almost made it to the 50% plus one. Uh, Mark, which is what the, what the polls had suggested might happen or had a good chance to happen, but mainly because uh, Jair Bolsonaro, the president, made, scored much, much higher than what all the polls had predicted. The, the difference was only about 5 percent. That on the one hand. And also people say they cannot explain how it is that Lula almost got 50 percent, but that in Congress and in the race for governors, for, uh, for the Senate as well, the conservatives, the ultra-conservatives, uh, ended up winning. So how do you vote left or progressive on for one for the president, but but conservative for the rest? Oh, and that was something that people just couldn't get it, their head around, and I think I, I can't either. Yeah, that's such a good question. <laughs> Guillaume, can you answer that for, for the people of Brazil? How's that well, possible? To be sure, it, it has always been this way. Um, <laughs> the, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the, the evolution of uh, legislatures in Congress, uh, Congress has become more and more conservative with time in, in spite of who was the president. So under President Rousseff or, or even Lula, we see a more conservative Congress getting elected. So I, I think that it has to do with the way people see the role of the president and the role of legislators. People vote for president uh, mostly based on economic considerations. Of course, this has changed in the last elections. I'd say that values uh, have played a very important role in this very context. But um, up until the early 2000s, we've seen uh, people voting with their pockets, so to speak. Uh, at the same time, uh, congressional elections are much more local. So people, for example, vote for their local pastor uh, if they're evangelical, or people vote for somebody they know. There is a very personalistic trait to elections uh, for Congress. So people vote for people who, who uh, appeared on television, who were a TV show host or something mm. like that, former athletes. So I, I think that uh, uh, it's inconsistent. It might sound irrational to some degree, but this is part of how things work in the presidential system, which has a very fragmented political party system. 
Thank you, Denma. I, I would like to add something to what you said, because I agree with you that, you know, there's very personalistic in the legislative elections, but also for president right now, it's been a contest of popularity. It's been like really, it's become almost cultish, you know, how people are for one candidate or the other. So this time around, it, you know, we had almost 90 percent of the people that had already decided which president they were going to vote for. So it was just like looking at programs. There were no programs, no platforms that were really presented. So I think that more than the economy right now is really this, you know, this personality dispute. Yeah. Also, Congress has another detail. Our Congress decision is so convoluted. It is this proportional voting that you vote for someone, but that person may not get elected. It'll be somebody else. And there's this some crazy equation probably crazier than what the posters use that leads to who actually gets to be elected. So it's it's a convoluted system that also makes it complicated for people to choose who they're going to vote for. I'm going to show you a couple of things. The, oh, oh, sis, uh, go ahead, Lucy. I'll go second. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, uh, uh, yes, a personality contest on the one hand. I mean, I think we saw clearly that the voters, uh, uh, almost 50 percent, liked Lula, but not his political party, the PT, which has, was, as we all know, very disgraced in the Lava Jato corruption scandal. And uh, so, it, so, but on the other hand, we also saw a shift to the extreme right. I don't, I mean, I know that they haven't always coincided, the presidents, with the, with the way Congress and the governorships work. But this time, the center right almost disappeared. And that is, that is different. Let me just point Absolutely. They got shrunk to almost nothing in, 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 in Senate and the House, right? Let me just bring up, just so that we can see the, the two candidates, because a few weeks ago we talked about these two particular candidates. So let's look at Bolsonaro, first of all, and his candidate card so we can see that and see what he represents. He's the current president, of course, of Brazil. Uh, that is what he represents. And then this is the other choice that voters had. Actually, they have more than they have more than two choices. Where these are the two top candidates, and this is Lula, um, who people already know in Brazil very well. Let me just show you again once more on my laptop. This is how the elections panned out, and with Lula ahead, Bolsonaro five points behind, and then the middle ground somewhere behind here. So when we're looking at what happens next, are we fighting around this area, Cecilia? Is this where the fight is going to be? Oh, yes. The fight started like a, a midnight point one <laughs> right after <laughs> the results came out. They celebrated and they went on talking to each other. And we had some of them already uh, uh, saying today, you know, who they're going to support. Even Ciro, who was really, really uh, tough on both Lula uh, and Bolsonaro during the campaign, he already said he will abide by his party decision to support Lula in the second round. But I think that the runoff is really a clean slate. It would be really hard to, to, to take what happened on the first round and add to it. But, you know, at least these, the, uh, this fight is ongoing and they're, you know, talking to, to Simone Tebet as well, who indicated, right? I don't know, Guillermo and, and Lucia, you're also looking, but she indicated in her speech, that concession speech, that she knew where she was uh, going to, who she was going to support, and seemed like she was. It was Lula. All right, Guillaume is smiling so broadly as if he's got inside intel. Guillaume, share. Yeah, I want to. I want to <laughs> add something to this conversation, which is I, I really see uh, the 2022 elections in Brazil, especially the presidential elections, as a battle of rejection, really, because uh, uh, the people who are voting for Lula right now, they are not really. I, I mean, not. They are not all voting for Lula. They are also voting against Bolsonaro uh, for the oh. terrible administration that he has uh, run. Um, at the same time, uh, most Bolsonaro voters, or at least a, a fringe of Bolsonaro voters, are actually voting against Lula. Uh, of course, there is an overlap, almost perfect overlap, between uh, Bolsonaro supporters and anti-Lula folks. Uh, in the case of Lula, things are not as simple. And that's the reason why I think that what we have to look into for the second round of elections is abstention. Um, Lula, Lula voters uh, in the first round, they are not as uh, convicted in their vote. So they, they are not 100 percent sure that they want Lula in, in office. Bolsonaro supporters, on the other hand, they tend to be 100 percent uh, with Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro will try to take away these votes uh, from Lula, not trying to bring uh, those votes for himself, but also, uh, but on the other hand, trying to uh, prevent those uh, voters from going to, to the ballot 
on October 30th. So I, I think that that's an important aspect because many people said, okay, Lula was the big winner of, of the 2022 uh, first round because after all, he was 6 million votes uh, in front of uh, Bolsonaro, but that's not really uh, what we will see in the, in the upcoming weeks. We might see Lula losing votes because people don't want to vote for him anymore or because people just don't want to go vote at all. Well, also, I don't really his supporters know are that, in the uh, lower uh, lower rung of the uh, income ladder, which also makes it harder for a lot of them to go vote, right? Lucia, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I mean, if they already voted once, I'm sure they'll want to go vote again. But what I'm what I was seeing, and it really, I, I I've been hearing from people is a lot is that they're very angry. They're they're. Uh, furious that they were forced to have to vote between Lula and Bolsonaro. They say that they've had the worst possible choices for Brazil, one a thief, the other who's going to be a thief or probably already is a thief, I'm quoting them, and uh, who's <laughs> probably a killer. Uh, I mean, you hear terrible things from both, and they say, why were we forced in this polarization to have to choose between them? Why didn't we have other choices or the other choices that we had were so clearly not going to make it that we still had to vote for the, one of the two, the lesser of the evils. And they're angry, and they're angry at both of the candidates and at, and at the situation. Uh, and and the, the sort of the violent rhetoric that's gone on and on. Uh, a person was telling me today that I've known for a long time, he says, you know, on my family, we have chats, but now people, we're, we're, we're all leaving our chats because we're fighting all the time on them. It's, it's so polarized that people are getting angry about politics, which is not the Brazilian way. So that sort of attitude may backfire also on some of the people who voted against Lula by yeah. voting for Bolsonaro. Yes, I have one more it, it, point it, I would like to bring in, and this comes from our audience online and also from our extended community. And this is uh, one thought from Ricardo Paul, who says, I'm concerned about the rate that the Amazon rainforest is being deforested, not thinking that either of those two main candidates are concerned about this. And then earlier, Carla Mendes sent us this thought. Have a listen, have a look. But regardless of who wins, the situation in the National Congress isn't, isn't positive at all, especially in the Senate, as many candidates who are elected, they don't support the environment protection and indigenous rights. But there are also some good news. For the first time in Brazil's history, two indigenous women were elected federal deputies, Sonia Guajajara and Celia Chacriaba. And their presence in the Congress will be key to fight against setbacks, against indigenous rights, and to protect the environment. Viewers, did you notice none of our amazing guests talked about the good news? I'm going to do it for them. Here we go. <laughs> These two candidates did really well in the October 2nd election. So you can see uh, indigenous representation growing for Brazil. Let us move on because one of the points that we wanted to really tackle was what is at stake for Brazil? either for another Lula presidency or a continued Bolsonaro presidency? That's a huge question. Um, Lucia, how would you like to get at that from an international perspective, the international community? What, what do you think that they're, they're, they're hoping for? Well, international is a very big word. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very, for example, <laughs> uh, former U.S. President Donald Trump congratulated uh, Bolsonaro for almost winning and for, for the big win that his party had in, in Congress. Uh, He's, in fact, he's even saying that it's thanks to him. But <laughs> that's a, a matter of, of, to be debated clearly. But if you look at Latin America, most countries were, are looking forward to having Lula because Lula is, engages more with the region. He feels that Brazil is part of Latin America. He's also, uh, he has also shown when he's been president and even when he, when he left the presidency that he believes very strongly in multilateralism in the United Nations. He helped form uh, UNASUR, uh, and, and other, and other uh, groups uh, in Latin America that were supposed to create or were hoping to create a kind of Latin American European Union. Uh, he's also a president who, when he, uh, who has a lot of experience in conciliatory uh, negotiations. He learned that when he was a trade union leader. You have to learn to negotiate, but in the, uh, but ultimately make deals. That's one of his. Uh, 
fortes, I would say. So in that in that sense, he was quite unusual because he got along really well with, for example, former U.S. President George Bush and also with Barack Obama, who considered him or who called him uh, at the time the most popular president in the world. So wow. he will engage much more. In, in, on the other hand, if, uh, if Jair Bolsonaro is re-elected, we already know that he has a far more uh, Eurocentric, US-centric vision of the world, mm -hmm. uh, and also doesn't consider, uh, considers Brazil uh, it's very inward looking. I think I'm not sure if I'm expressing myself properly, but, yeah. it, but it looks towards itself. It doesn't really, with the exception of the example of, at the time, uh, former U.S. President Donald Trump, it didn't really relate to yes. other governments or other causes. Yes. Lucia. Yeah, uh, once I, once I, Go ahead, Leon. Yeah, once, I, once I've heard that, that uh, I mean, from Bolsonaro's uh, uh, allies, that Bolsonaro was a beacon of the Western civilization. So I think, I think that it, it sort of conveys the kind of uh, vision that <laughs> Bolsonaro has uh, for, for the world and, and, the, and Brazil's role in the world, to be sure. Uh, but let me add a couple of things to, to this, this point that Lu Lucia has uh, brought up. Uh, first of all, I think that we are going through a pink tide or a red tide in South America or in Latin America more broadly. So we see elections in Chile, in Colombia, uh, left-wing presidents getting elected for the first time in the case of Colombia, for example. So Lula might be um, uh, some some gust of fresh air to, to South American politics in a way. So uh, they, they, they are looking forward to Lula because not only is he super uh, pro-integration in the region, but also because he will uh, re-energize the left in, in South America. So that's uh, one important point. But I think, and let me just add to what Lucia said, I think that what's at stake here is uh, two very different definitions of democracy. I, I think that Lula and uh, most of the, the, the other candidates, such as Simone Tebic or Ciro Gomes, they, they do believe in a, in a, a, a liberal democracy for Brazil. So they, they see Brazil as a government for everyone, uh, where major, uh, minorities have to be uh, contemplated as well. And this is very different from what Bolsonaro um, stands up for. Bolsonaro is in favor of a majoritarian sort of democracy, which tends to be very dangerous. I think it's much along the lines of Trump in the United States, the idea that a government, uh, although elected democratically, it has to govern only for the majority of the population, not for everyone. Um, and I think that if Bolsonaro uh, uh, mm. wins the elections, we are going to see a, a very different construction of what democracy is about, taking us to a situation that really resembles what we see, for example, in countries like Hungary, the notion of a, an illiberal democracy, a country where the executive branch uh, takes over uh, the country and most policies uh, are basically directed at the majority of the population, which in Brazil's case is Christian, conservative, or I don't know, uh, uh, Okay. White, I'd say so. White, yeah. There, there's some. And, yeah. yeah. You, you mm -hmm. hesitated on, on the white, but I, I think that's absolutely yeah. right. Yes. Let me just let me just uh, interject just for a moment because I want to hear from mm. Bolsonaro himself. This is how he sounded on October the second. He looked exhausted, but this is what he felt was at stake for Brazil. Let's have a listen. Let's have a look. What worries me is Brazil losing its freedom. Brazil following steps to the left, in the same path as Venezuela, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Nicaragua. That's what I worry about, where the first victim is the freedom of the people. So many questions from our audience. So Cecilia and Gilliam and Lucia, this is the speed round. I want instant answers, no hesitating, all right. Uh, Andrew Ryan asked Cecilia, is there an increased likelihood of extremism during the runoff election, your thoughts? It could be, but there was a, a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, expectation that there will be a lot of uh, violence now, and there wasn't really. It was you know there were a few cases here and there of people gluing <laughs> gluing the numbers in the machine or breaking the machines. There were a few instances, but it wasn't widespread violence as was expected. So I think second round, it's a little bit deflated. He also didn't dispute uh, uh, the election as fraudulent, so I think his. Uh, his constituency, which was calling for, you know, wherever the violence, call for violence was coming from, is a little deflated right now. So I would wait and see, but right now okay. I'm not expecting that. Thomas asks, uh, this is a very simple choice between democracy and barbarism. 
Lucia, how would you frame the choice that Brazilians have coming up for October the 30th? I think one is a regression, a regression social in terms of social values and social freedoms. I always find it rather extraordinary that, that President Bolsonaro tells people that this is about freedom. I'm wondering which freedom is he talking about? Because uh, Lula and the PT and his previous governments weren't, were very middle of the road. They were not at, at all extremist left wing. Uh, not in the least similar to Argentina, or not Argentina, I'm sorry, to, to uh, Cuba or Venezuela, uh, the, as, he, as he mentions. Uh, he, made, he had a vice president who was right wing and represented the empresario class. Uh, he always uh, went very much in the middle of the road. He just helped distribute uh, wealth a bit better. Okay. I think that that's... Well, so, see, I have an answer uh, for that. I think that that's what we have. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I think I have an answer for that. Um, it's freedom not to wear masks. It's freedom not yeah. to take their shot, yeah. COVID-19 shots. It's freedom to scold people and get away with it. So it, it's a very uh, libertarian yeah. notion of freedom. Bear arms. Which takes to, uh, yeah, yeah, to bear arms. So it's it's basically a, a Thomas Hobbes-like scenario of state of nature. That's that's the freedom <laughs> Bolsonaro is really talking about. Really. Interesting. But well, it's not freedom to have an abortion. It's not freedom for women's rights. It's yeah. not freedom for a whole lot of other things. So, or to have any other religion. Any other religion so that's not... It's a masculine really kind of freedom, right? All right, let's, let's hear from Lula, because we heard from Bolsonaro. And again, this is the same time frame, just after the October the 2nd election results were announced. So Lula knew that he was ahead, but not enough to claim the presidency at that time. So he is looking forward to the next few weeks of campaigning. And this is what he told his supporters. In the second round, I believe that things will be more civilized and Brazilian society will very quickly learn the difference between our candidacy, which defends the truth and democracy, it defends the social welfare state, it defends the respective participation of women and black Brazilians in politics, and on the other hand, a candidate who doesn't like democracy, who doesn't like culture, who doesn't like books, who prefers to talk about guns. A person who has no pity or compassion for the hunger of 31 million people in this country. Cecilia, there seems such a clear difference between these two candidates. How do you think the runoff elections are going to go? The campaigning, I, I won't ask you about the results. <laughs> a lot of people see this uh, speech about uh, supporting uh, minorities or rights for black uh, Afro-Brazilians or for women and all that as actually a very bad thing. Uh, so we have a, a, a large group that believes that these rights are over overdone that um, people are actually, that whites, so to speak, and middle class are losing their privileges. So that's what we're up against. It's not disagreeing with Lula, per, uh, uh, not thinking that Lula is wrong. It's just thinking that this is not the way they want to go. So that's where uh, I think that we have, you know, a strong middle class and upper middle class across Brazil in the smaller uh, towns and all that, that kind of show a very strike preference for, for Bolsonaro's speech. Guilherme, I'm just thinking, um Go ahead. Cecilia, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Kilian. I, I just want to add something to what Cecilia has just sure, said. I, I think that uh, even though it's super important to have indigenous uh, representatives in the House, for example, or or women or uh, black Brazilians, uh, it, it, representation is indeed very important at this point uh, as a barrier uh, against Bolsonaro's uh, base. But at the same time, I think that identity politics in Brazil has backfired. So um, the left wing and Lula cannot just... Uh, uh, make statements for, for these minority groups. They have to reach out to evangelicals, for example, in Brazil, who happen to be uh, the, the, the fastest growing population in the country. We're talking about 60 million evangelicals in Brazil, and the Workers' Party has no channel of dialogue with these groups whatsoever. So it's important for uh, Lula not, not to, to refer to them as evil or as stupid or, or uh, a basket of deplorables or anything along these lines. It's important to <laughs> reach out to these groups uh, in a very moderate way. I think that Lula knows how to do this, but I think that the militancy of the Workers' Party has uh, often has a tough time framing these discussions in a more moderate way, because to many, uh, everyone who's voted for Bolsonaro is a fascist. 
And if yeah. things are framed this yeah. way, there will be no dialogue whatsoever until right. October 30th. Maybe. And maybe the, the, the candidates the, will the take... Misinformation, uh, this, the misinformation battle is sure. raging already, right? So. All right. So, yeah. so maybe the candidates, yeah. if they have time to watch the stream, will take their lead from the moderate way in which you framed the conversation. Thank you so much, Lucia, Cecilia and Gilliam, and viewers as well for weighing in on your thoughts about Brazil's runoff elections coming up on October the 30th. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.